I just want to say thanks again for having me here, um, giving me this opportunity to share um, some of my research about Black designers, specifically um, Black women in design. So my presentation is um, basically going to focus on seven, I think it's seven women in design, and they are not the only ones out there. Um, there are more than you think. But um, these are the ones that either, um, there are a couple of them who, uh, for instance, like Louise Jefferson, I've been doing research about her and her work for a while now. Um, but a lot of these women, um, I haven't um, been researching them for a long time. This is kind of new for me. So um, I just kind of want to start off with um, just sort of a little context about why I do this research. Um, so according to AIGA, AIGA did a survey back in 2019 that said that 3% of the people in the graphic design profession were Black. Um, back in 1950, that percentage was 1%. So the percentage may be off by a few points, so let's round that off to five, but Still, in 70 years, the percentage of Black people in the graphic design profession has increased by 2 to 4%, basically, which is crazy. <laughs> graphic design has always been a white male-dominated profession, which is one of the reasons why I started doing research about Black graphic designers. Um, I was embarrassed and frustrated when I was in graduate school when I realized that none of my favorite graphic designers were black. None of them looked like me. None of them came from the same social and economical background as I did. Uh, I couldn't even name when I was in school any historical and influential black graphic designer. Once I started this research, another thing that became apparent was that there was a lack of well-known black women, uh, which is why about eight months ago, um, when I actually met Cheryl D. Miller, was one of the reasons why I decided to um, focus some of my research on discovering Black women in design. There are plenty out there, but if you don't know who they are, if you never heard of their names, you don't know where to start or where to look for, right? So, but I, my hope is that um, this talk will at least um, give you just like a little small snippet about the work of some of these women and maybe spark your interest so you can do your own um, investigation and research. So one of the first women that I've ever done um, design research on is Louise e. Jefferson. And I actually discovered her um, some years ago, maybe, I don't even know, maybe six years ago, I think. Um, I often do research at the Amistad Research Center here in New Orleans, which is on the campus of the university. And at the time I was doing research on um, uh, publication design, Black designers in, uh, from magazines. And so um, when I was leaving, I asked the uh, head researcher there if there were um, any other information or people, any other Black designers that he can sort of lead me to who work that they had. And so he asked me if I ever heard of Louise e. Jefferson, and I said, no, I've never heard of her. Who is she? So he handed over this paper that was um, a bio of her, you know, just giving some background information about her work. Then after that, he gave me the handout that you get, you know, when you go to do research, it shows you, they show you like all the files that they have, like all the boxes that they have in the folders of that person's work. And there were so many boxes, so many files, and I was overwhelmed with emotion. Um, some of it was joy when I saw all the type of work that she does. Um, she's a cartographer, a graphic designer, an illustrator, a photographer, a published author. And to say that she's multi-talent is an understatement. And I don't mean multi-talented, like she's a jack of all trades and she does all these things at a, you know, at an okay level. No, she, she, she's actually, um, really good in every last single one of these areas. But the main area that I'm gonna probably focus and talk about today is show a little bit of, you know, some of her design work and some of her calligraphy. 
Um, she was born in Washington, D.C. Um, she comes from a family of artists. Uh, her dad actually was a calligrapher for the United States Treasury Department. Um, and he basically encouraged her to draw at an early age. He taught her his craft at home, and she later started fine art and commercial art and private lessons at Howard University. She later moved to New York City to continue her education at the School of Fine Art um, at Hunter, and at uh, Hunter College, at the School of Fine Arts at Hunter College. When Louise was, um, when she moved to New York, um, it isn't quite sure why she actually moved there. Some sources, some things I read said she moved there because she um, felt like, you know, if she can make it in New York as an illustrator and a photographer, then she can make it anywhere. One was that she just went there to visit one of her friends, um, Ma uh, Molly Pari, who is an activist and an attorney, and that she um, had some money stolen for her, all the money that she had, and she was too embarrassed to go back home to her parents in DC, so she just stayed there. So. Her and um, uh, Polly Murray um, became roommates. Um, they both were in school together. Um, and, you know, just like most young artists in New York during this time, we we're talking about during the Depression in the early 1930s, they struggled financially. So, one of the first freelance jobs that Louise received was for um, Young Women's Christian Association, designing posters for them. She also received a job, you can advance the slide. Um, at the National Council of Churches publishing operation, which was called Friendship Press. Uh, she started working there around 1935, 1936, was actually in the very beginning stages where they start publishing books at Friendship Press, which means that she was actually one of the first designers or creative people to actually work there. Um, so they offered her a full-time job um, in 1935 and then around 1947 she actually um, became the creative director there and she was the first black person to actually have um, a director um, creative director role in the publishing industry and one thing I want to say I want to talk about uh, one of the books here so Louise Jefferson never ever complained about being black or being a black woman. She never sort of talked much about that being an obstacle as far as her advancement in the career. And with all the work that she's done, you can kind of see that. So she, um, but this book here, We Sing America, this book here was actually um, a book that was banned by the governor of Georgia um, because he didn't like the fact that there were illustrations in there that included black and white kids playing together. So he ordered that all the copies of this book be uh, burned and destroyed. Not only did um, Louise Jefferson work full time for Friendship Press, but she did a lot of freelance work for other publishing companies like um, Doubleday, Macmillan, um, and Viking. Um, you can advance to the next slide. <laughs> for 40 years, like, 40 years straight, she designed almost all of the seals, um, the holiday seals for the NAACP, which you see here. And for 20 years, she designed um, all of the program colors for the National Urban League. And most of the, the imagery for these stems, um, she used a lot of cutout paper, right? That creates, you know, nice areas of um a flat color you can see um in some of these there are some hint of calligraphy which is something that um you'll see a hint of in a lot of her work like in a book cover design she actually um, ran her own design studio where she offered calligraphy services and you know just from looking at her you know the various um type of work that she did there are sometimes, um, her calligraphy is so good, like sometimes I have a hard time distinguishing whether or not it's calligraphy or whether it was actual typeface mm -hmm. that was used in the work. Um, her style, she used a lot of sort of like traditional serif typefaces, but she also sometimes you'll see hints of like um, circus fonts like Davida um, in her work. 
we can advance. So not only did she um, design uh, hundreds of book covers, um, the illustration and photography, she also, um, she also did cartography. She also did tons and tons of research on maps. She did this map called Uprooted People of the US, which is one of a kind. Um, it was the first map to focus on social costs and impact of the Second World War. Most Victoria maps of the period appeal to um, patriotic uh, sentiments to bolster morale. Themes of dislocation and disruption were common um, in her picture maps. You can't advance. So, Louise worked for uh, Frenchess Press for 20 years. She, um, or maybe a little over 20 years, she uh, retired around 1960. And from 1960 to 1970, she actually took five trips to Africa. A couple of those trips were funded by the Ford Foundation. Um, and she took so many trips because she wanted to sort of document the, you know, um, details of the culture um, in Africa, because she felt like um, that at that time, people didn't know a lot about it. All they knew was, you know, sort of like the stereotypical things, you know, that they would see on TV and the media. And so she really wanted to sort of capture the essence of it. And so over that period, what came out of those five trips with a book that she wrote um, and published called The Decorative Arts of Africa, which you can actually still find on um, online for actually really cheap. That book includes 300 images, um, solely, mostly created by her. So they include photography um, of her documenting um, everyday life of, um, of Africa and different tribes and cultures. Um, and they also include illustrations. Now, most of the illustrations, they're not all in color like this. Um, so when I go to the Amistad to do research, they actually have like so many like original drawings of her work. So <clears throat> some of these illustrations are in color in the book and some of them are in black and white. Um, the other work that she did and she's um, well known for is her photography, her photography work, although she doesn't like anybody, you know, I read in interviews where she hated being called a photographer because she didn't, it was kind of like a hobby. Like she took her camera with her everywhere she went. Um, but when I went to the Amistad, they actually have like 5,000 um, photographs, you know, that she took of either when she was in New York, of things that was happening out, you know, like out in the street. She, you know, um, she was a part of, you know, a lot of artists and, and people of the Harlem Renaissance, you know, and musicians and painters and stuff. And, you know, she has images of Lena Horne and Thurgood Marshall was one of her neighbors. Um, so she was definitely a photographer um, as well. Next. So the next person, the next woman is, um, is Dorothy Hayes. Uh, Dorothy Hayes, uh, became interested in, in graphic design while in high school, um, which I always personally find interesting not to like date myself or tell my age. But when I was in high school, I never even heard of the term graphic design. Seriously. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear uh, that term until actually until I got to college when I was taking art classes. And um, one of my art teachers was trying to get me to go from being an English major and go to the art department. And so I asked her, I was like, well, what do people do? Cause I didn't know anything. I was like, what do people do in art to make money? And she was like, well, they, cause I just thought about people being, you know, I'm from New Orleans in the French quarters, painting portraits for money. I didn't know that people actually made money doing art. So she said graphic design. I'm like, well, what do graphic designers do? And she said, well, you know, they design magazine covers and they do layout. It just sounded so boring and uninteresting to me. Anyway. I'm sorry, I digress. <laughs> um, so Dorothy, uh, she she's from uh, Mobile, Alabama. She attend, attended Alabama State College and moved to New York in 1958 to continue her education um, at Pratt Institute of Advertising. And she eventually graduated from Cooper Union um, with a degree in graphic design in 1967. She was determined to render respect, she said, 
in the field as both a woman and as a designer. Um, when she first arrived to New York City, she said that she couldn't find any Blacks whom she could relate to professionally. The ones she tried to talk to wouldn't talk to her or they would just brush her off. She also said this experience, um, this experience basically soon prompts her to be a role model for future Blacks and to create experiences to spotlight their work and achievements, which I'll talk about in a little bit. She went on record to say, and I quote, when I came to New York 10 years ago, I couldn't find anybody black in the commercial art field. You can advance. Finally, after I found a job on my own, I did start to encourage black people. But in the course of trying to develop my own talent, I discovered that if I went to them for a direction, they would just, they just wouldn't give it to me. Nobody wanted to take the time to show or tell me anything. I vowed that if I made it, I would never turn my back on any black person who came to me for advice and information and who really wanted to learn. Hayes continued to be vocal about her experience. She also stated, I was employed by a well-known broadcasting company and led to believe that I would hold a design position. Yet I was never allowed to do anything but non-creative work. I was frankly told that my employment was simply a form of tokenism. In an effort to support and advocate for other Black designers like herself, Hayes teamed with book designer Joyce Hopkins in 1970 to create 49 Black designers into an exhibition entitled Black Artists in Graphic Communication at Rhode Island School of Design, Woods Jerry Mansion, Wood, I'm sorry, Wood Jerry Mansion, which included the work of Louise E. Jefferson, um, and also the work of George Oden. And if you had never heard of, are familiar with George Oden's work, he's a, was an African-American graphic designer who did a lot of work for, um, uh, for CBS. Um, he is, his um, stamp that he designed, I think it was the Emancipation Proclamation stamp, is mentioned, one credit, one caption in mags, I think the fifth edition, that's it. But anyway, um, He's actually um, one of the first people that I discovered when I started doing my research on black designers. Anyway, um, so Hayes was discovered um, discouraged by her work and experience of not feeling um, like she was being taken seriously in the industry. She opened up her own design company called Dorothy Doors, um, which was a design firm in New York. I haven't been able to find any other a lot of information about the work that she did um, at a design company. And also um, I read that her bio was rejected by Wikipedia because it didn't have, it didn't meet uh, notable guidelines. So this poster here, um, Black Artists in Graphic Communication is the poster that was designed for the exhibition. Um, Color is a state of mind is a poster that she designed. It was sort of like this, um, artist call and the only um one of the requirements was that just to design something that addressed the theme of black and white and at the bottom is an ad um advertising for the Tepa topographers association of america club events so cheryl d miller um I met Cheryl just recently, um, this summer, uh, she is organizing, uh, putting together a project with Stanford university that's to, um, archive the work of black designers and it's to archive the work of black designers who are actually still living. And so, um, Shara decided that she was going to, um, donate her work from her design studio to Stanford. And what she was going to also do is invite about 30 other black designers to donate their work as well. So I don't know how she got my name or how it came about, but what she did was she actually had conversations with each person whom um, work she was interested in being a part of this project. So that's actually when I first met her. And so before we had our talk, I looked her up. I tried to find all information I could about her. And again, it was 
a very similar feeling that I had when I discovered Louise E. Jefferson is when I read about, you know, about her work, I'm, I was like, how could I not know about this woman? How is it that I never heard of her? Why don't I know about her? So, um, Cheryl, uh, sort of describe her, her design work, um, or she likes to think about design as a tool to give a voice to the communities that are often ignored. Um, she considered the work that she's done, um, social impact, corporate communication design style, advance. As a child, Cheryl uh, mentioned that she often felt isolated because of her, her ethnic background. Her father is African-American and her mother um, is a Filipino. But she often stated that this isolation actually helped prepare her for um, a career in graphic design where the experience, you know, where you often feel isolated when you're experienced um, as a minority in this community. Um, her mom worked as a nurse at Howard University. And during this time, um, oftentimes when she would be waiting to, to be picked up, she would roam the halls of the university and, um, you know, experience going through the campus galleries and museums. Um, but when she was in school, she was told by a teacher that she was wasting her time studying art, that she would never make it um, succeed in the profession um, as a professional. But she didn't let that discourage her. She still um, persevered and applied to, to RISD, to Rhode Island School of Design, and was accepted in spite of that same teacher basically trying to block her or stop her transcript of being submitted. Mm -hmm. She attended RISD for about a year, but then she had to um, move back. She got transferred um, to MICA. Um, when her dad got sick or her dad died. And so she moved back um, to Maryland and she transferred to MICA where she also had a, diffi a difficult time getting critiques from her peers and from the faculty. So what she would do is she would, um, when nobody was in the critique room, she would go in and hang up her work um, and then wait for the other students to come in and overhear them actually critiquing the work, not knowing that it was actually her work. And she actually got a lot of good feedback that way, but still they didn't know um, who work it was, but that's what she had to do in order to get feedback, um, any kind of uh, critical feedback on her work. After she graduated from MICA, um, she found work um, designing, um, doing graphics for local television stations. Um, and one day unexpectedly, she received a call from Robert Johnson who shared his vision for setting up a network for black television, i.e. BET. And so she was um, commissioned to design the logo for, for black entertainment television. And in 1885, her and her husband uh, moved to New York City after her husband got a job um, with American Express. And once in New York, she did get a job offer from ABC which she turned down because it was $10,000 less than what she um, was making before. And so after that, she had a difficult time finding work. And so she ended up applying to grad school at Pratt and she got accepted um, to attend graduate school there for only three semesters. Um, while she was in graduate school, she was told that her graduate thesis couldn't just be, it couldn't be another project. Um, that she had to have designed a project that actually um, sort of contributed to the field of graphic design in a major way. Her thesis, which is titled Transcended the Problems of Black Designers to Success in the Marketplace, was published um, and printed by Print Magazine um, under the title of Black Designers Missing in Action, which addressed the problems of how there are few Blacks in, graphic, in the graphic design industry. Shara has written two other follow-up essays on, on the topic. She was extremely successful when she was in school. Um, you can advance. Mm -hmm. And she was offered a job to work with one of her professors at her firm. 
And she worked there for about six months and left there six months later to start our own firm, Cheryl D. Miller Design Incorporated in 1987, which was one of the few women, black women owned design firms in New York City. She had several um, clients, including Chase Bank and American Express. These 500, these um, Fortune 500 companies often hire Miller's firm to create in-kind projects for black organizations. Miller states that these projects literally documented our experience of the civil rights era. During a conversation that I had with her, basically I was interviewing her and I asked her, how in the world did she get these companies, these 500 fortune companies to trust her um, with that work? And she said that um, her dad um, was an exec for the federal government. And she said that she had always done this kind of work, even as young as the age of 15, she was creating logos as a teenager for, um, for business execs of, of her father. And she said it was just expected of her to, um, to succeed and to do great work. And so the network that she had built back when she was a kid um, with um, company owners by her dad was um, why she was able to get them to trust her to do this work because she had already been doing it for such a long time. Next, Cheryl White um, Washington. Um, at the age of three years old, um, she could be found in her grandmother's kitchen, rearranging the collection of salt and pepper shakers, <laughs> um, which was her first clue that she was on the path um, of design. She had, um, like a lot of people um, that I talk about today, uh, a lot of them, one of the things that I found is that they all seem to have people in their family who are artists um, in different areas of art. And so the same thing um, was it Michelle. Her journey as a graphic designer and educator and writer reflects an um, approach to life and learning each area of her work and farming and overlapping others to form a unified whole, whether she's teaching at the graduate level and doing exhibition design in a class at New York's Fashion Institute, FIT, or, you know, you can find that she's working with clients at our firm, Washington Design in Brooklyn, in the Dumbo neighborhood. She brings a structured, nuanced combination of eclectic influence to bear on the finished results. Slide. Her design embraces the world of hand-based craft while remaining modern and disciplined in regards for formalities of topography and compositions. Here's a quote from her about her inspiration. She says, I find the work of photographers inspirational and printmakers and sculptors because each has their own sense of visual language. Washington work incorporates language and writing systems from other cultures, from Zimbabwe to Native American to Korean, and what she calls an under, understated and indirect way. She uses letter forms, symbols as background patterns, slide, blowing the type up, or hand printing wood block type over a silk screen to create rich, densely layered surfaces. Paging through her process sketches and finished projects ranging from posters um, at Dumbo's art festivals to packaging design for a line of company of her own line of natural body and home products, um, which reveals a love for pattern and textures that's paired with vivid color and saturated surfaces. Her color sensibility blossomed from an upbringing of the ocean and her grandmother's church hats. <laughs> the colors and I quote from her, the colors you like depend so much on where you grew up. Light and bright environments led to bright colors, she says. She continues to state, in Atlantic City, with the wide open seaside light, our neighbors always had beautiful gardens. Just a magnetic, a man, I'm sorry, just a manageria of colors. There were flowers everywhere. Ever see black women's church hats? My grandmothers wore hats covered with flowers. 
not sedate like, you know, Queen Elizabeth. These were exuberant and descriptive. You could tell a woman's status in the church and community just by looking at her hats. So the next two um, <clears throat> women um, is Syria Harris and, and Gail Anderson. Um, and I would say again that for most of the, the women that I'm talking about today, they have way more accomplishments than what I'm saying. So what I'm talking about is just a little snapshot into um, their work. Um, Sylvia Harris is, um, she was educated at Vermont College, uh, Commonwealth University. She received a BFA in communication arts and design. Um, her interest in design led her to pursue an MFA as well at Yale University for graphic design. And at Yale is where she actually discovered her passion for democracy, history, equal rights, <clears throat> these were, these concepts were, um, this is where she became interested in these ideas. The concept of designing for the common good became an important aspect of her work in her career. And after she graduated from Yale, her and two other partners formed in a, a design studio called 212 Associates. Her first graphic, which was our first graphic design firm. While she was there, um, one of the major projects that they worked on was doing the complete rebranding of the Central Park Zoo. Um, and this was one of the pivotal um, projects to basically move her career forward. Slide. However, the design of the entire zoo was extremely ambitious. It included signs, print collateral, information boards, and displays which solidified her mastery and accessibility of design for public. Harris shared her knowledge with graphic design students at Purchase College State University of New York and graduate students at Yale. She was influenced in the development of, she was also influential in the development of Yale's first graduate level information design classes. She organized her students to take on the daunting task of redesigning the U.S. Census 2000. She encouraged thoughtful design choices that allow an accessible space for anyone to easily engage with the information presented. She was also the founder of the nonprofit Public Policy Lab, which is dedicated to improving public service and empowering Americans through design and policy. She established the Citizen Designer Movement before her untimely death in 2011. And she was, in 2014, she was awarded the AIJ Medal for a commitment to design for the common good. Um, I also wanna say that if you, if you get a chance, I strongly suggest reading her essay called Searching for a Black Aesthetic in American Graphic Design Education, which discusses how Black students are at a disadvantage in school because of the omission of Black designers being left out of the graphic design canon. Next. <clears throat> Gail Anderson shows an appreciation of art and design from a young age, creating magazines for the Jackson Five and other pop culture figures. She later took drawing classes at Pratt and soon attended SVA, where Paula Scher was actually one of her mentors. After graduating, Anderson went on to work for Vintage Books in the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine. And in 1987, she, get, um, she began working for Rolling Stone Magazine, where she would stay there for 15 years and serve as the senior art director of the magazine. Slide. After her time at Rolling Stone, Anderson moved to Spotco, where she began to create posters for various plays. Slide. Along with her work for Broadway, she also published around 15 books about graphic design with longtime collaborator, Stephen Heller. Slide. In 2012, she was commissioned by the U.S. Postal Service 
to design a commemorative stamp celebrating the 115th anniversary of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Gail and the USPS art director Antonio Acala collaborated with Jim Sheridan of Nashville's fame Hatch Print Show to produce the final version of the stamp, which was also made into 5,000 letterpress posters. The initial run was of 40 million stamps and they all sold out. The USPS released an additional edition of 10 million. Gail now serves on the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee for the USPS as Design Subcommittee Chair and can tell you all about postage stamps um, if you have the time. She'll be more than sure to talk about it. Next. She's, um, Gail Anderson has always has, um, I would say that her passion is in topography. You can kind of see that in her work that topography has a really strong um, presence. She's um, obsessed with typist element, with typist object. She developed her type style, um, which is developed, is um, heavily influenced by old advertising posters, vintage signage, pages from antique um, specimens, type specimens books. Um, and she's also managed to incorporate this style into commercial fonts and lettering. Next. These are um, just some book covers of the, I think maybe 16 books that she's co-written with um, Stephen Heller, but these are um, just some cover designs from two of those books. And aside from being a prolific graphic designer, Anderson is also a dedicated um, educator. She's a professor um, at SVA where she teaches both undergraduate and graduate courses in graphic design. Okay, next. Oh, and just one other thing. She currently, her um, design studio, she has a design studio with um, Joe Newton um, and it's called Anderson Newton Design. Um, and I would say if you're interested in her work, it's really easy to find her work online. So if you just Google her, um, she has like three websites. One is called the Curly, something like the Curly Girl or something. And then there's another one that she has with Spotco and she still has the website that's called AND, A-N-D, Anderson Newton Design. So the next two um, designers that I'm going to talk about, um, I don't have a lot of biographical information. Their work is still um, new to me, but I just wanted to sort of talk about them um, just a little bit. So um, the one thing that they both have in common is that their work moved beyond the 2D printed page into digital spaces of design and technology. So Robert Lynch is the chief art director of her firm, Negacurrent Studio, which specializes in um, projection design, motion graphics, print, and multimedia. Slide. Um, the studio Negahertz was largely inspired by um, Max Bill's 1931 poster for an exhibition of African art. Um, six years later, um, African art along with American jazz was labeled um, Negersterns or de uh, degenerate art by the Nazi regime of 1937. So she just basically took and re, um, she took and recontextualized the name to fit our studio. Uh, she's worked as slide as an art director at Warner Brothers Records. Um, she's also been a creative director at Electra Records and VP of Creative Services at Impulse, Rec Impulse Records. And she's seen um, many um, international InDesign awards um, for her work. Uh, she's also done work for uh, Spike Lee, Stanley Lawson. 
She currently teaches, uh, she's an associate professor um, in graphic design at the program at Purchase College SUNY, um, where she teaches motion graphics, print, and topography. And Cheryl just mentioned that she was her, her thesis coach. She could probably give you way more information about Robin. Next is uh, Loretta Staples, um, who is, uh, she received her BFA in History of Art from Yale University and studied graphic design at RISD. Uh, for 20 years, she worked as a graphic designer, exhibition designer, slide, and interaction designer. And from 1900, I'm sorry, 1990 to 2002, she focused exclusively on the design of graphical un, uh, user interface at Apple Computer. With her design firm, U.I, and uh, which is a e-business, which was which was an e-business um, strategy consultant firm. Her work included specialized applications, conceptual modes and models, and prototypes for emerging technology. Before becoming interested in software design, slide, Staple was a graphic designer for the Understanding Business Exhibit Developer for the Burdick Group and Textile Curator at Yale University Art Gallery. She's um, lectured widely um, on digital technology and design and has participated as featured speakers at conferences all over the world about digital technology and user interface design. Um, she is retired um, in the field of graphic design and she um, now actually works as a, uh, she has a private practice as a psychotherapist um, and her focus is on how to sort of use art, um, um, I guess as like a, as a um, healing uh, capacity. So that's my, um, I would say, um, that's the conclusion of my presentation. So I wanted to close with this essay that I wrote um, back in the summer. Um, and just to give like a little context, um, everything was going on with um, social unrest, uh, the murder of George Floyd. And so, um, you know, a lot of universities and companies and studios was sort of rethinking um, just sort of design or, or not really rethinking design, but sort of thinking about like, how can they create spaces for, you know, BIPOC people or people of color to sort of voice, you know, um, to give them a platform to voice, to, to, to um, express themselves. Um, so at the time, um, California Institute of the Arts, CalArts, um, where I got my um, MFA degree, um, we're in the midst of installing an exhibition called um, Inside Out, um, which was a poster exhibition from posters from the program for the past 30 years. Anyway, make a long story short, the, the curator, Michael Worthington, decided that it was important for there to be, or he thought a Black voice should be um, uh basically incorporated into the space. So he asked me and Silas from Rome to come up with an idea to um, incorporate some text. Well, he didn't He didn't come up with the idea of text. We came up with the idea of incorporating text. So we each wrote these essays that, um, that sort of dealt with our experience of being a Black designer. So my essay um, was called, Where Are the Black Graphic Designers at CalArts? And I wanted to read it just to sort of give like some kind of insight to my experience as a Black designer. Not many Blacks have been fortunate enough to attend the CalArts graphic design program. Not many at all. I started putting together a list of Black designers at CalArts. And so far, there are 20 people on that list, including myself. Let me break it down. Over 25 years, from 1995 to 2000, an estimated 20 Black students graduated from the graphic design program at CalArts. 
That's less than 1% of the graphic design students. I believe that list is incomplete, although I'm unsure of to what degree, and it only goes as far back as 1995. So some people are missing between 1970 and 1995. So I sent my list to Lorraine Wow to see if she could help me fill in the gaps and give me some names before 1995. And she said, I quote, your list is interesting and to be frank, humiliating. And I could, couldn't agree more. It's ridiculous. When I attended Kellogg's visiting day, I don't remember being worried or concerned about the possibility of being the only black person in the program. I was the only black potential student at the visiting day, but that didn't bother me either. I was happy to be invited. I remember being in the grad critique room when MFA students presented their work. I have no idea what they were talking about or what their presentations were about because I was so mesmerized by the posters that were on the wall. And I kept wondering, was it possible for me to make that kind of work? <clears throat> I'm gonna skip through my thoughts about the poster. Um, so I was accepted into the three-year track, which was for people who either didn't have an undergrad degree in graphic design or who lacked graphic design experience. In my case, it was both. Every fall semester, the first MFA activity in the group project was called a design charade. It was kind of like an icebreaker, you know? So for my first year, the project was titled Design and Monument to Style, which was the line pulled from Paul Beck's teaching notes. We were encouraged to interpret the prompt as we like. We had a week to create a design. One of my groups built a full-size car out of cardboard. Not one of my groups, one of the groups, I should say. On the hood of the vehicle was the Confederate flag. Or maybe it was on the side of the car or boat. I actually don't remember. But what I do remember is walking into the room right before the critique and seeing the Confederate flag. My stomach began to feel uneasy. And all I could think of was, here we go. Really, Kelly? I could have stayed in Louisiana for this. Mm. Seeing the Confederate flag on the car left me questioning whether or not I had made the right decision. I don't think I'm overtly sensitive, but I wonder why did they have to use that symbol? This is Cal Arts. Students here are supposed to be smart, creative, and inventive. Why use a Confederate flag, especially if it's only to serve the purpose but to reference the Dukes of Hazard, which is the iconic car, the General Lee. Was it satire? Was it supposed to be funny? During the critique, I believe it was Lorraine Wilde, or maybe it was Michael Wardenson, my memory is fuzzy, who asked the students if they considered the history of the Confederate flag. What that symbol stood for, to me, that was semiotics 101. The students all stood looking confused, and eventually you could see that they were embarrassed but still trying to defend their bad decision by saying, we didn't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. The discussion to continue to address how it can be considered offensive to people. Hello, I was some people. I was the elephant in the room. I was the only black student in the graphic design program. This was my first critique. There were only four students in the class. I was the only one that was black. I was the only black student in the program, period. The students stated they did not intend to promote white supremacy, that the design had nothing to do with that. We all knew and understood the Dukes of Hazard reference to the General Lee car, but still not a good idea. Because for me, a black person, that flag represents hate, inequality, injustice, pain, and racism. Honestly, I don't remember all the details. I know the faculty chastised them for using the Confederate flag and being naive, ignorant, callous by incorporating it into their design. But I do remember what I said to them. I said that since I was the only black person in the program and perhaps the only person who may or may not be offended, someone should have at least asked me how I felt about it. The fact that no one thought to have a conversation with me about it, that it didn't even cross their minds was really disappointing. After the critique, I believe three out of four students in the group apologized to me. Still the main culprit, the student who had the idea to include the Confederate flag did not apologize. And I barely talked to him. I barely spoke a word to that person in two years I was in the program. 
During my second semester of my first year, I began wondering when was the last time there was a black student in a program? Where are the black designers at CalArts? I asked the faculty this question, and I also asked this question in my work. I began to ask this question at CalArts and in the field of graphic design as a whole. During my second year, Cameron Ewan, a black student, joined my class. And during my last year, Silas Monroe, another black student, entered the program. Between 2006 and 2007, my last year, there were five black students in both the undergraduate and graduate programs. To those five students, to those five black students, I regret not asking them if they shared the same feelings of isolation and lack of confidence as I did. If they exhibited insecurities that negatively affected their work. I never asked them if they ever felt embarrassed or frustrated by not being able to name one black person who had made a significant contribution to the graphic design canon. I never asked them if the lack of role models left them feeling trapped in a strategy of imitating an aesthetic of people who are culturally, socially, economically different from them. Maybe they didn't feel trapped in the way that I did. Maybe they didn't feel trapped in that way, but I did. I always felt good and confident in my knowledge about Black history, Black culture, and my Black identity. I struggled to find my voice. Not knowing or having a knowledge about Black graphic designers left me feeling voiceless. Thank you. Tashika, that was amazing. Um, I really, the, the story you just told and read to us was so moving and important for us all to hear. And I'm sorry we had some struggles, but I thought your presentation was amazing. So I want to thank you deeply for that. And I'd like to see um, if we have questions um, from everyone who's here. So I uh, encourage people to unmute and ask their questions. I loved that essay so much. I just want to say that. Oh, thanks, Heather. Thanks. You can, um, if you guys go online to um, to redcat.org and you type in um, inside out, upside down, or you can even type in unseen objects, you can download my essay and Silas's essay. You could also do a virtual tour of the exhibition and you can see our essays that we designed into the space. So it actually works just like this on um, this timeline that basically separates the the posters. And so um, our text, we call it's a collaborative project where we designed our test text um, in the exhibition. So you can um, find it online if you want to check it out. We'll definitely do that. Someone beat me to it in the chat. I think the link is there. Yeah. Um, but there's also a question um, for you, Tashika. How difficult is it to find information on Black women artists or designers? Oh, um, it's really difficult. Um, so, for instance, sometimes I might come across a name. So people know that I'm doing this type of work. So, you know, I'll get an email from a colleague or someone that says, hey, you know, I bought this book or something. I looked in a design credit and I saw it was this you know, this person, and then it kind of ends there. You know, you go online and you, you try to look for more information and then there's just, isn't a whole lot there. Um, it's been really hard um, to say the least. I mean, it's, and, and honestly, you know, even if you have a name of a person, um, it's still really hard to, you know, go beyond the initial, you know, link or whatever you find online like wikipedia posts so you have to do like this you know okay so where did they work or where did they go to school and then you just start contacting people you know that way but it is still really difficult and honestly when i first started doing this work um for a while i didn't have any black women um and although i knew of gail anderson and her work believe it or not i didn't even know she was black so, um, you know, it's just kind of like the nature of it. Sometimes you don't, you don't even know. Um, and I think some people, um, 
don't necessarily want to be sort of put into a box like, oh, that's that woman black designer or whatever. But I think my feelings about that is that until there's more information or knowledge about it, like I don't care, talk about Tashika the black graphic designer because if you don't know of any, we have to start somewhere, right? Um, so yeah, it is difficult. If you're interested in sort of discovering more people like you who do the type of work that you do, I always, like I always encourage my students to do like local research, like do research of design work in your own community. Um, I had a friend who, um, she teaches at a university in Missouri, St. Louis, I think that's the name of it. Um, and she went on sabbatical and she did this research project and she was interested in finding about um, type type design. And so what she did was she started doing research about type designers in St. Louis. And she actually discovered that there was like, um, St. Louis was known for like uh, a plethora of type designers. I mean, type, not type designers, sorry, type foundries and printers. And so, you know, had she not started, you know, locally, she would have never, you know, sort of just, you know, found or discovered that information. So I would say start within your own community, just because you have access to it, like you have access to the local library, right? The local, local library is a treasure. There's so many weird, crazy things that you'll find, you know, in local libraries. If you live close to, um, you know, uh, if there's a university or any kind of like academic institution, go and look at their special collection, see what type of work they have in their special collection. Sometimes you'll be really surprised on what you might discover. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You. I didn't actually think about the library. I don't know why I'm there all the time. I, I've like befriended all the librarians, but I've never thought about thinking about their special collection because it's just hidden in a back room somewhere. Yeah, and they probably don't have anybody asking about them either. So they'll be more, they're usually way more than happy to help you because nobody is in there bothering them. <laughs> Heather pointed out in the chat that Cheryl, Cheryl Miller, who you talked about, was the woman who was just talking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really important point to make um, that we had one of your featured designer artists with us. Yeah, I wasn't sure if people made that connection. And um, I don't know if I said this, but actually my conversation, yeah, it was my conversation with Cheryl that made me, you know, that basically sort of highlighted that for me, like, you know, in my mind, I never thought about focusing on women in design, a black women in design specifically. It just never crossed my mind until I started talking to her. And she, when she had her own design firm, she talked about how she em employed several other black women. And so that just started making, you know, that made me think about, wait, well, there are probably a lot of them out there. So she was the one that actually kind of, um, she didn't tell me I should do research on them, but you know, she kind of like dropped it, you know, dropped some knowledge and got me interested. I think it's really important um, to point out that you, you know, you you got on the phone or connected through email or you, you found people that you interviewed. And I think that many people are very open to being interviewed and that it's an important research tool to, to take that step. And I think um, it sometimes we hesitate um, and particularly students might hesitate to reach out but I think that it's a really important step and information gathering is in that way is really excellent yeah Dolores I'm glad you said that because I think I mean I even remember back when I was an undergrad or even back in grad school um, being shy being, you know, but that didn't stop me. Like I was scared. It might take me like two two days to send an email, you know, to someone that I would think, you know, well, they don't have time to respond to my email. I'm nobody, right? And they do, you know, you'll be surprised. And I think now if there is research that you're actually interested in, contact these people before they're not here, like before they die, literally, you know, um, talk to them. Like Cheryl, is probably one of the most unselfish 
people that I know out there. Like she was so open and generous of her time. And there are a lot of people, a lot of designers out there, artists, whomever, people that you're inspired by that will probably are more than willing to, you know, people like to talk about themselves, believe it or not. You'll be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but just contact them. They'll, they'll, they'll give you the time. You'll be surprised. So don't be afraid. I mean, you know, get your email together, run it by, you know, by Heather or somebody first, you know, like, is this okay? And then send it. <clears throat> I can tell you about, maybe share just a little bit why, why I went to graduate school. So just a little bit about more detail about my background. I'm horrible at writing biographies too, I should say that. Um, <laughs> I keep it vague, but um, my actual, my undergraduate degree is actually in English, is in, uh, English writing. And so I, I, um, I only got a minor in graphic design, which was actually my last year when I was in college is when I discovered it. So I worked for maybe, when I graduated, I worked for about a year and four months. Before I went back to graduate school, I worked professionally at a magazine. Um, and the reason I went to graduate school for two things. One was I knew that eventually I wanted to teach. So I knew that I needed an MFA to do that. The other one was topography and motion graphics. So at the time, um, I was very insecure about my design skills because I didn't have a degree in graphic design because my focus in, in college was 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 writing. Um, and then, and but I knew um, that topography was important. And then at the time, I was doing motion graphics, just on the side, not professionally, just like for fun. So I wanted to go to grad school to to actually just be a better topographer. Um, but what I what I learned and realized while I was there that it was really about sort of kind of discovering me and my voice and really think about actually what I actually care about out in the world and how I wanted to use graphic design to either comment on it, to bring light to it, um, because this wasn't graphic design in and of itself that like I was excited about. I actually just started as a way to, um, I just wanted to use design to kind of highlight things that I was interested in. I was always interested in like, you know, African-American culture and identity, um, um, specifically to um, stereotypes and sort of, that's another like research interest that I have about like, the word stereotypes and how black people have been sort of um, portrayed um, through pop culture over time, especially when in the beginning they didn't have control of those images. So what I would say, um, that's not to say that you can't try to find your voice or your way in undergraduate school, but I think graduate school is different to where most of the time in undergrad, most of the time you're giving projects and there's the, the assignments are probably already kind of prescribed and mapped out for you, not saying the outcome. And in graduate school, you have more sort of lead way to get more into the things that you're actually really interested in and sort of mapping out and carving out those projects yourself or making your own projects, basically. And it gives you more time to do research, I think, to like really go deep into a particular subject matter or a theme or content. So I highly recommend. But we all know as designers, you don't need a graduate degree to, you know, to practice or to work, right? So usually, I think more often now, it's more of a personal discovery. And Heather and Robin and Lauren and the Lord, other people can kind of speak to that experience as well. I went to grad school not even two years after I graduated from undergrad, um, but I was an undergrad for a longer time. So I wasn't like your traditional, like graduating at 21, but I was younger. Um, I think I graduated like two, it's been so long I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> graduated <laughs> in 2007. <laughs> So yeah, like I graduated from undergrad in like 2002 and I was in grad school in 2004, so there you go. But if I had a degree in graphic design, I think I would have waited a 
I would have waited and worked longer, to be honest. Maybe even five years. But um because I think it's important to get some work experience before you just jump into grad school. If I had to think, you know, sort of pros and cons versus waiting or going right in, I will say that for me personally, because I went not long after where I still didn't have a whole lot of professional experience in graphic design, was that the work that I was doing in grad school, it took a long time for me to realize that what I started doing <laughs> started when I was in graduate school. Like I wasn't even able, it took like so many years removed from that experience to realize the, the sort of trajectory of my work, right? So my first job after I graduated, besides trying to start my own studio was, I actually worked at CalArts in a design office doing like traditional graphic design work. like you know, doing all the prints, collateral and material for the, 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 for the institution, as well as like, you know, digital stuff. Um, and I was so consumed in that work um, that it was not about me or what I cared about. It was about whatever the in-house client wanted. So it took me a really long time to kind of figure things out and, and, and try to make the connection to like, the research I was doing and the making I was doing and how to make, to sort of bring that back into like my daily practice, which why I think the, I'm such a huge fan of besides the fact that I, I teach there at VCFA is because how the program is structured to where like, you still continue to do the work that you're doing right while you're in school. So the program actually helps you carve out that time while you're still doing the things that you're doing. Where, because I went to CalArts, I have more of a traditional, like I took three years off and was in school. It, I had a, a more difficult time figuring out that balance. Whereas at VCFA, once you graduate, you already have that time, you know, that, that you put into your practice. They may, you know, Heather may not still, you know, spend 25 hours a week on her personal work, right? It may be like five or 10, but there's still, you know, it's still there, right? It's still a part of your, <laughs> your daily or weekly activity.